Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Future of Work in a 100-Year Life. I'm Ramona Schindelheim. I'm the Editor-in-Chief for Working Nation. And for those of, you, uh, those of you who do not know, Working Nation is a nonprofit content provider, and our mission is to shine the light on solutions to the skills gap through storytelling. So we do videos, we do town halls, we do uh, articles and panel appearances here. So we like to bring together people who can talk about solutions um, for getting people skilled up and reskilled for jobs now and in the future. And in this particular um, conversation, we're talking about older workers uh, because we are working, living longer and working longer. And uh, before I introduce all the panelists, I want to share a couple of maybe surprising facts with all of you. Um, I believe they're surprising. 63% of all adults 60 to 64 still work. 40% of all adults, 65 to 69, still work. And in about 15 years, one in three Americans are gonna be 50 or over. And our life expectancy, the average, is seven, about 79 right now. And some age futurists right now believe that the first person who's gonna to live to be 150 has already been born. So it's important that we talk about the issue of how we make sure that the older Americans, older adults, are skilled for jobs now and in the future. So to have that discussion, I'm joined on stage here with Paul Irving. He's the chairman of the Milken Institute Center for the Future of Aging. And next to him is Andrew Scott, author of The 100 Year Life and for former deputy dean at London Business School. And next to him is Judith Spitz. She spent 30 years at Verizon, uh, tech career, 30 years at Verizon, and then founded, uh, founded a program called uh, Whitney, which is Women in Technology in New York, which is an industry and academic partnership to get women interested in uh, technology careers. Uh, next to her is Tyler Bosney. Oh, so sorry about that. Bosmani, he's the CEO of Clever, which is a learning platform K through 12 in schools. And next to him is Eunice Lynn Nichols. She's the vice president at Encore.org and is in charge of the Gen to Gen campaign. Okay, um, getting started, I wanted to first turn to Paul and say, so with this idea that one in three Americans will be 50 or older in 2035, We've heard it described as the silver tsunami, and I know you have some very strong feelings about that phrase, so we want to start with that. So, Ramona, you know I just hate that. I hate that phrase. <laughs> <clears throat> so she's trying to provoke me at, at, at the outset. Yeah. So, so, so you're, you're right. We're going to have a doubling of the, of the population, 60, mm -hmm. 60 plus globally by mid-century, from about a billion to about 2.1 billion. Uh, the number of 65-year-olds in the United States is, is going to double. Why'd you point at me? Uh, I'm just, just just making the point. Okay. Um, so so yes, many many people uh, talk about this as as a silver tsunami. But my my challenge to them is is this: it's an unbelievably defeatist notion. I mean, uh, the older adults are the, are the largest uh, growing population in this sense in, in the world. It's a it's uh, the the only growing natural resource mm -hmm. we we have in the world. If we don't figure out a way to utilize it effectively to capitalize <clears throat> on this wellspring <clears throat> of, of, of talent, in a, in a sense, this, mm -hmm. this fountain of age, then, uh, then the results are, are going to be not only inevitable, but, but very disturbing, and they're unnecessary. And that's the point, and I know we're going to have a conversation mm -hmm. about that today, lifelong learning very much being part of it. Uh, but there is another road, there is another way to think about it, there's another way to, to approach uh, aging, uh, not just from a policy perspective, but from an individual perspective. And I think it's something that all of us should be thinking about and, and talking about. You know, I often say that, that uh, we will never have in common race, race and gender, ethnicity, relig religion, and political belief, but, but aging is the one thing that we all have in common. If, if we're lucky, we all have a stake. In, in changing the way we, we think about age, aging and ensuring that we mm -hmm. capitalize on, on the, the potential of this demographic shift. And you look at longevity and the, the idea that people have to work longer, some of them have to and some of them want to. So it's important to 
consider both of those as we look so, at? So certainly in, in the U.S., I mean, Andrew, we'll, we'll talk about the, the U.K. and, and, and uh, make some global observations, but in the United States, we've moved from a society that was uh, populated uh, by, by most people who, were, who enjoyed the benefits of defined benefit pension plans and, 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 other, and other pension schemes, and now are self-dependent, now are, are dependent on 401ks and IRAs and 403bs and, and other kinds of of self-funded retirements, mm -hmm. and what that means is for most people, uh, more work, uh, more more income, or more revenue generation is is important. Uh, and and for those for whom that's not a consideration, the the notion of challenge, engagement, continued meaning, uh, purpose is is equally important. And I, we can talk about it. There are mm -hmm. there are incredible. I always say to people. You know, work is not just good for your for your wealth; it's good for your health as well. And I'd be happy to talk about that later. Yeah. And Andrew, that kind of brings us into your book, The Hundred Year Life. And you talk about we're no longer in a three-stage life of school, work, and retirement uh, because of people living longer. Sure. There's a multi-phase life. Yeah. Uh, so uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here. So. Um, so I come at this from an economic point of view, and I think what's interesting, and you rightly pointed out these extraordinary demographic statistics, but I think you know, one of the challenges we've got is everyone's aware that there's going to be more old people, but what people are less aware of is that how we're aging is changing. We are, on average, living longer and healthier for longer. And average is kind of a big word here, but on average, that's what's happening. And really, what's occurring is not about end of life, we often call this about aging and we all go straight to end of life, it's about all of life. And in the 20th century we started to adjust to a life of 70 years and we created a three stage life of education, work and then retirement. And we created new stages of life, we created teenagers, previously we just had children and adults and of course we created pensioners. Uh, but what governments are kind of struggling a bit with at the moment is they're trying to stretch that three stage life to deal with life expectancies of 85, 90, 100, or perhaps even 150, as you mentioned at the beginning. And it doesn't work. You know, the consequence of a 100-year life is a 60-year career, which when we said to the publisher, do we call the book a 100-year life or a 60-year career? They said, we think a 100-year life will sell a lot more than a 60-year career. <laughs> um, and you know, you think about education is so front-loaded. So we're having to change. We've got more time, and we're going to restructure the course of life. And we're already seeing people behaving differently in their 20s, their 30s, etc. So that's kind of the context in which I see this. I think that has a number of implications, uh, which perhaps it might be just worthwhile dwelling on at the beginning. Um, the first is everyone's kind of a social pioneer. We're trying to find new ways of doing things, whether it be your 20s, your 40s, or your 60s, or your 80s. And the role model of your parents and what they did no longer works. So we kind of don't know. We're all doing this big social experiment, which is both fun and a little bit nerve-wracking. Uh, the second is that there's this just massive institutional lag. Corporates set up their employment practices predicated on the notion of a three-stage life with retirement at around about 60. And it's struggling with the increase in numbers that, uh, of people who want to work or need to work. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of corporate problems there. And of course, and this is why I think this event itself is so interesting, there's also a lot of educational institutional lag. Because if we have a three-stage life where the first stage is about education, we know that reinventing, recreating, relearning, unlearning, we'll have to completely develop adult education in a way that make it much more central than it's ever been. So there's lots of challenges around that. I think one of the things I'd like to sort of point out, though, before we sort of go into a longer debate, is that I'd like to say this isn't just about older workers. Everyone's trying to find ways of doing, learning new skills, more flexible working, and doing things differently. Uh, and there are some specific challenges around older workers, but I would be very keen to avoid it becoming just about older workers. Uh, so I think this is about remapping uh, the course of life for everyone, and there's lots of shared issues as well as different ones. Um, the other thing I'd like to sort of point out is actually there's been quite a lot of progress made already. Uh, if I was doing, looking at the U.S. job numbers and how they've changed the last 20 years. So the U.S. has seen an increase in employment of 22 million the last 20 years. And 90% of those jobs are workers aged over 55. 14 million of them are from people 55 to 64, and 6 million 65 plus. 
And it's not just there's more older people, so there's more older workers. People are choosing or needing to go into the workplace. So there's lots of problems, but actually we're already beginning this adjustment. And in fact, the silver tsunami that I, I share Paul's dislike of, <laughs> it's not coming through in the welfare state. It's not coming through uh, as consumers. It's actually coming through already in the labor market. And Judy, you, you and I, when we talked earlier, you were kind of referring to the founding of um, Whitney as your second career, mm. uh, so to speak. But in kind of in this context, we're talking about it's just an extended career. And uh, we just also discussed that this issue, talking about older workers, it's kind of a canary in the coal mine for everyone, that we have to pay attention, that we have to become lifelong learners. So I wanted to hear from you, like, your thoughts on that. <clears throat> so I think there's the sort of two sides to uh, thinking about this uh, lifelong learning and who are we talking about and what kind of learning do they need to be engaging in. So if we think about it sort of on an individual level, and, and I think my career is sort of a living example of it. Uh, so I had a 30-year career at Verizon. I started in R&D and ended up as the chief information officer of a Fortune 10 company. I've never taken a computer science class in my life. I've never written a line of code. So the question is, what is it that I was learning from the start of my career to the end that allowed me to keep progressing? And I think that uh, there are sort of three things. One is be a great storyteller. Two is be a systems thinker. And three is uh, collaborative leadership. And I think those are skills that anybody can learn uh, or they may, in fact, inherently have uh, that can be developed throughout their career. Um, and you hear companies talk now, today, all the time about they don't care so much about skills. It's this other sort of uh, soft skills, you know, kind of. They say that, but of course, people get evaluated and hired on skills. So, uh, so I think, number one, we need to empower today's workforce to uh, to um, be uh, to leverage those capabilities that they have as their ticket to uh, you know continued employment, um, and we don't do enough of that. I think uh, the second thing is is this, of course, uh, uh, this idea that technology is disrupting everything about uh, about work and employment. Um, and that, that's only going to continue to change at an exponential rate. And this future, this concept of the future of work, which I think of from a technology perspective, uh, you know, AI-driven and so on, uh, that the thing that we need to grapple with is that the future of work and the future of AI, and therefore workers, is going to be uh, really a collaboration between humans and machines that this constant you know, hysteria around uh, machines taking over right. is not what the future is going to be. It's going to be this collaboration between humans and machines. And so the skills that are necessary are perhaps an entirely different set of skills than the people who are developing the technology as to be skilled <laughs> at that kind of uh, collaborative partnership uh, um, evolving job descriptions that are at the heart of this human-machine collaboration. Uh, and uh, in that realm, uh, it's an entire di entirely different skill set. It's an entirely different future of who that future workforce needs to be. If we only think about it as you're either developing the technology or you're uh, losing your job because of the technology, you're missing really what the essence of the future of work is going to be and where I think the opportunity is. Totally, totally agree. I, Tyler, I want to pick up on something Judy said because uh, you were telling me, and you're a tech company, yeah. and uh, is it six years old or yeah, seven? seven years old. Seven years old. And <laughs> when you're the baby on the pam panel, <laughs> and when you started the company, uh, you were in your 20s, and you hired people like you, right? And so... Talk about what you learned over those couple of years and why, how you changed your workforce. Yeah, sure. First, thanks everyone for having me and for coming today. Um, when Ramona first asked me to be on this panel uh, and Deborah, they mentioned that they were looking for the perspective of a millennial CEO. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I was offended. <laughs> 
<laughs> As somebody who talks often uh, about the challenges and opportunities of managing a millennial workforce, um, I was uh, you know, shocked that they thought I was a millennial CEO. Um, <laughs> Then I actually looked up the formal definition of a millennial, and it turns out that age range is a little broader than I realized. So I'm on this panel only having just learned that I am a millennial, um, and still dealing with that reality. Um, but, uh, but your question was uh, a good one, which is, um, my experience building Clever uh, has been an interesting kind of journey, and I think a very typical arc that a lot of startups take. Um, where we, in the early days of Clever, you know, it was me and my two co-founders, and we had this mentality that what we were trying to do, we were trying to build this, the single sign-on por portal that all schools in, in K-12 education could use. And we, we had this innate belief that what we were trying to do before had never been done. Therefore, experience wasn't that useful. And so when you are starting a company and you discount experience, what that leads you to do is hire uh, you know, people who are um, just really eager, really hungry, really excited mm -hmm. about the mission, probably you know, like you. And it tends uh, to push you to hire a, usually a younger workforce. And so if I look at the early days of Clever, that was <laughs> what we did. Um, and one of the most interesting things for me as a CEO, one of my learning arcs, has been, you know, fast forward seven years later, uh, I think rather than, you know, uh, running from experience, I think we've really built an appreciation for experience. And if you look at the age of Clever and the age of our workforce and the amount of experience bringing in, it's really increased, especially over the past couple of years. And I see so many startups, especially here at ASU, where so many of these companies are trying to get started, trying to get their first mm -hmm. legs. We were back in the startup competition six years ago. It's how we got our start as a company. Um, so I have a lot of empathy with those startups, and I see them all kind of at different points along that journey, from experience being uh, you know, this thing you run from to this thing you run towards. And so anyways, that's been one of my learnings. And I think as we're thinking about 100-year lives, um, and you know, uh, bringing that experience into the workforce for longer. Uh, I hope more companies get to go on that same journey uh, because I can say from the Clever perspective, it's one that's really benefited us greatly. So in, the, in your work environment, how has the younger workers taken to the older workers? And I know we, sh we shouldn't have to be having this conversation, but I think it's a reality that there's a lot of younger people who maybe don't want to work with older people because they don't think they understand technology and maybe some of the older workers are going, oh, those kids, you know, but. Yeah, th there's definitely things that come up. Um, yeah. uh, like, you know, sometimes people join Clever and they are shocked at how much, how many Slack messages can come through in a single day <laughs> from so many different directions. Um, but I'll tell you, by and large, the, the reaction has been extremely positive um, because one thing that uh, the millennial I still say it like it's an other. Uh, <laughs> one thing that millennials want uh, is mentorship and growth and development. And that's something that, uh, you know, you, with the right hire and the right uh, level of experience, they, <laughs> they tend to really crave, I'd say maybe more so than, uh, than even generations past. And Eunice, that is what you do. Your campaign, yeah. Gen to Gen, is a mentoring program. Why don't you tell us a little bit of how that works? Uh, absolutely. So the campaign that I'm running right now at Encore is designed to mobilize older generations to stand up for and with young people. And I'm really relating, Tyler, to your experience because this campaign grew out of an early program that Encore created called Experience Core. And our sole purpose was to bring older adults into public elementary schools to help kids read by third grade. Like your experience, we <clears throat> staffed the work mostly with AmeriCorps and AmeriCorps Vistas, young people who were mobilizing older adults to come into stipended roles in schools. And so I had that early experience of working with a very young staff to do some great work in public schools. But over time, because I was immediately surrounded with 200 older volunteers um, at a young stage in my career, I started to see the potential for older talent to be engaged in so many different ways, not just as volunteers, which is often where we think of 
um, older, older adults. They have more time. They can volunteer. But we started to recruit some of those volunteers to become volunteer coordinators, to become recruiters out in the community. Um, I had many people that were working for me that were 30 years older than me, um, absolutely mentoring me as I was running this program. And um, when I think about the work of the Gen to Gen campaign, it's really this vision of what are, uh, we need more creativity and how we engage older adults in both um, in the longer life, in the work world. Um, I'm particularly interested in how older adults can stand up for and with young people because um, if, if the working world is a place now where we most naturally have four to five generations together, and then you look at society where we've done everything we can to separate the generations, and we have to care about the work environment as a place to, to bridge those divides and do it in healthy ways. Um, but then if we can get multi-generational workforces in education spaces and youth-serving organizations, then we have a shot at having children see those healthy relationships play out um, with multi-generational teams that are providing services to them, interacting with them, mentoring them. Uh, then I have some hope that maybe we'll walk into a future where those young people grow up and just have an expectation that they can work in a multi-generational world, play out their family lives in multi-generational spaces, uh, and I just think we'll, we'll all be better off for that. Do, do any of you have any thoughts on how we achieve that? I mean, programs like Gen to Gen, to Gen seem like a very good thing, bringing the older experienced workers in. Is, does there need to be something more formalized? Um, I'm just throwing some ideas out there. How do we get everybody on that same path? Because I think it's important. It is. I, I've got a, just a, a, it's not a particular program. I, I would just like to bin generational labels. I think discussion of generations is fine, but actually just generation labels are one of the most unhelpful things I've ever come across. Uh, and I know it's a useful, I mean, you, you comically said about how upset you were to be called a millennial. Um, you know, it, it's just a very simplistic way of characterizing. I could, it's kind of like a, a version of sort of demographic astrology. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, and it just points to the very fact how separated we are by age. People are people at all different ages. And the idea that you can characterize this group as millennials and this group as baby boomers, or whatever labels are, is just really, really corrosive. And I think what's really interesting is for most of human history, two things have held. One is we haven't known how old we were. Most people didn't know the day they were born or the year in which they were born. So they never bothered about their chronological age. Uh, secondly, for most of human history, we've never had generational labels. Uh, Shakespeare didn't write about the equivalent of millennials or whatever it would have been in those days. Uh, but in the 20th century, as we become more age segregated, we can become obsessed with these labels, and I think they are so unhelpful. I've read, uh, there's a little bit of truth in them, but there's really not much. So I would just say let's yeah. stop all talk with them. Uh, and I, I not only endorse Andrew's notion uh, in the sense of agelessness as, as being the ultimate objective, mm -hmm. but really, you know, in, in the wake of the decoding of the human genome, when we know that, that biological age trumps chron chronological age in, anyway, you know, the notion that somehow the number of years you've spent on the earth, you know, dictates uh, your level of competence or capability or interests or biases or anything else just makes absolutely, absolutely no sense. So the answer, you know, we've got to figure out ways to, to change uh, all of the institutions of, of society. You know, I, I'm glad we're in an environment of, of educators and people who who, who serve educators? Because one of the things, and I, maybe I should be careful with a with a prominent, you know, academician sitting sitting next to me, is that is that universities have to just radically shift their their models today. Universities fundamentally serve young people. It made a lot of sense for a lot of a lot of their history. You know, I always talk about Harvard University opened opened its doors in 1636. It wasn't ASU. <clears throat> uh, and and so at that point, I suppose it made some sense to create an institution focused on young people because the opportunity, the demographic opportunity of, of attracting old people, didn't didn't make a whole lot of sense. But things have changed a lot, and so you know, things like uh, mainstreaming continuing education programs. Well, I, you know, I think you know Eunice talked about age segregation. Why do we kind of put old people over on the side of uni universities with, right. with, you with do each get, other. You put them on a track put, where they are segregated. In, include, yeah. include them, include yeah. them with, with young people. The, the, the exchange and, the, and the, the, the complementary skills and interests and talents and, and all the rest are a beautiful thing. Why not capitalize on it? And frankly, it's a business opportunity, right? It, it expands the, it expands the, mark, the market for education. So 
any university president that isn't thinking ab about an ageless approach to, to the student population of their institution is thinking uh, with, with kind of yesterday's metrics and yesterday's news. So when I was coming down to this session, I can see the conference is called 10 times or 10x? 10x, yeah. What, what, what is the 10x about? Uh, it's, it's the 10th, 10th anniversary. Because it actually is another way of looking at that, which is great for this panel. So in the UK, the sort of the, uh, adults of education age for higher education 20 to 24 is about 4 million. If you look at the total size of the adult population, it's 45 million. In other words, it's 10 times the traditional market size, the uh, education sector. So this is fantastic opportunity. But it's interesting you mentioned Harvard, because at Harvard, when it started up, you probably went there when you were 13 or to 24, so it was a lot more mixed. Right. But what we're going to have to start to think is what type of education? Am I going to college to learn adult skills like living on my own, in which case that's still going to be for the young? Am I going to college to get a new sense of purpose and values, in which case that could be throughout your adult life? Or am I going to college uh, doing a course to learn some skills to keep my job, get my next job, uh, or help myself through uh, the fact I've lost one job and going to another? So it just becomes radically different. And I think that's why we're seeing such interesting focus on different providers, different products. But I don't think age is the key issue here. You, and, you, know, you wanted to add something. Oh, I was just going to say, um, I want to dwell for a, a minute on the idea of ageless. Because um, I think I'd prefer to think of how we can be more ageful. Because I, I don't think it's, well, I appreciate, Andrew, your perspective on generations and generational labels being unhelpful. I actually find, uh, I've, I've worked a lot in multicultural communities, and I find Western communities tend to want to gravitate more towards where, uh, let, let's, let's break down all the labels, nobody's old, nobody's young. And I grew up in a, in a Chinese immigrant family. There are many cultures where there is an honor placed in experience and wisdom and more, and more comfort, even with the term senior or elder or things like that. Um, I think there's a way where as we get younger and older generations and more proximity to each other, we can both um, not have the harmful stereotyping that happens, but also see the true, um, you know, whether it be the energy and enthusiasm of young people at a appropriately uh, time in life when things are opening up yeah. with older generations where they're often looking at how they can pour into um, leaving a legacy. And there are some unique dynamics there that are really powerful. And so how can we see each other um, with, that, with that in place? Just to clarify, I have no challenges about recognizing that over the course of our life we change and we should honor that. But generational labels seem yes. to be a subversion of that idea. Yeah. That, uh, you know, and I think that's particularly dangerous in the workplace. Yeah. Yeah. Tyler, did you want to add something, or Judy? Yeah, I wanted to respond to something Andrew said. Uh, you, know, you, you talked about the, uh, how college was changing, university was changing, and how that could expand to include you know, uh, 10x the market. Uh, so the, uh, from the Clever perspective, we've got a front seat on the K-12 side and how that world is changing. Um, for context, about half the schools in America use Clever, and they use it to access this whole new world of personalized learning software that students are using more and more. And in this new world, students are learning at their own pace. Many times they're, learning, they're choosing what they learn and how they want to learn it. And there's been a lot of talk at this conference and at many other places about how much that's improving the K-12 through experience. But what not a lot of people are talking about is how much that could improve students' entire lives with these foundational skills. If you think about it, K-12 through is just 13 years of your life. But as we live longer and longer, you know, get to 150 years, the fraction of your life is smaller and smaller. So what's becoming more important is what skills have you learned? What, what desire for you know, uh, learning and, and uh, lifelong learning skills have you developed? Um, you know, Judith, I'm guessing with your amazing rise to be a CIO of a Fortune 10 company, uh, that wouldn't have happened if you didn't have these amazing lifelong learning skills. And, you know, so I am so optimistic about how K-12 is changing for this new 100-year life in a way that's going to set our next generation up really, really well. And, and we've seen that growth and that explosion at Clever. Um, you know, there's bridges in terms of how we get there, and, you know, not everybody's in that world today, but, but I think the future's really bright. Um, I wanted to say that if you guys, we have, we're going to have about 10, we have about 10 minutes left. If anybody wants to ask any questions, just step up to the mic and... Feel free to ask a question. Um, meantime, I wanted to get back to the idea of technology changing really rapidly, because I think that's important in this conversation as well, because 
at Working Nation, we look at programs that are helping people upskill, retool, and you spent your life in um, 30 years career in technology. How fast do you think it changed then, and how fast is it changing now? Well, I used to say I spent my life, but now it's only a small piece of my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, in those 30 years, uh, a bunch of things happened. In 1985, when I started my career, um, the technology that I had to learn about was fax machines. Uh, there were no cell phones. Uh, there was just the beginning of email from a corporate perspective. And I worked in a telecommunications company, so uh, which I happen to think is the most exciting industry on the planet in terms of the impact that it has on all of our lives. So, so everything changed. I mean, absolutely everything changed. Um, but one thing that changed that not everybody is aware of is uh, that in 1985, the participation of women in all of these technology fields was actually around 37%, which isn't fantastic, uh, but uh, it's not terrible. Um, and over the course of my 30-year career, and I swear it wasn't my fault, uh, that number went from 37% down to 18%. And that's remarkable. Uh, it's, it's startling, actually, because, of course, in that same 30 years, technology became the driver of, uh, of, of most jobs. So, so one of the concerns... Uh, of course, the Whitney program that I launched is trying to bend that curve in the other direction. The whole uh, mission of the organization is to uh, um, uh, deliver programs in tech ecosystems that will double the number of undergraduate women that are choosing to move in this direction. But as we talk about getting back to this sort of mentoring older and younger, you know, one of the dangers is, is that the, uh, the older workforce uh, in the tech space is predominantly male. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, of course, creates a whole different challenge in terms of who's going to mentor uh, the next generation of tech workers, uh, of tech women, uh, if we get them in there. So mm -hmm. that is a challenge that we have to face. I, I want to go back and just poke a little controversy into the conversation. Please <laughs> That's do. That's okay. Uh, I, I, don't dispute that labels are bad things um, because they overgeneralize and lock people into spaces. But there's a, a, a thought leader in leadership that I think is wonderful. His name is Michael McAbee. If you haven't read anything about him, you should. Um, and he is a Freudian trained psychoanalyst and a business leader. So it's an interesting combination. He made an observation that I think is really illuminating and has, goes back to the mentoring uh, um, question, which is that, um, uh, of course, we learn about leadership from the first leaders we have in our lives, which are our parents, uh, and we take those models of leadership into the workplace with us. Um, so uh, uh, styles of parenting have changed over the generations, and the baby boomers, I'm one, to use the label, grew up with parent as authority figure. We took that model into the workplace, boss as authority figure, and all kinds of roles and expectations derived from that. Uh, baby boomers raised their children, millennials, if you will, uh, uh, with a different model, uh, which is parent as fulfiller of their dreams. Right, our job, take a look at the current scandal, was to do everything possible to make sure that our children had what we considered to be fulfilled lives. And that they took our, our, those children took that model of leadership into work and looked at the corporation and employers as, what are you going to do to make sure I have a fulfilled life? I understand it's an overgeneralization and not everyone's the same in both cases. But it's an interesting relationship when you talk about these two generations or, or uh, mentoring each other. Uh, and really educating each other, because I think that there's value in both perspectives. And I'm on an advisory board of an AI startup company, and I can tell you that when I talk to the young people there, uh, what I bring to the table in terms of uh, what's your responsibility um, in terms of partnership with your customers and so on, uh, and they bring to the table sort of this um, uh, uh, a much harder line around uh, what their product can do and what's right and what's wrong, as opposed to seeing, 
there's a lot of learning that can go in both, in both directions. So I think some sensitivity to the fact that we do come from different perspectives is actually <laughs> healthy. Uh, and that we can learn from each other. But so, so the, but this makes the point about the the power and potential of this intergenerational bump, bumping, you know, bumping together in, in the in the education environment, right? Different different perspectives, different different uh, different interests in in the work environment where we know, uh, and there's obviously there's certainly increasing ev evidence that that we're seeing that intergenerational teams outperform same age teams of, of any age. Mm -hmm. Uh, pr probably, probably under understandably. So, the point is, and again, back to Eunice's point about about uh, addressing age segregation. We need young people and old people bumping into each other. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. By the way, it also, to an extent, explains our politics. Probably both both Andrew in the UK and in the United States. And that is this kind of divide, what we sometimes call in in the U.S. the divide between the, the gray and the brown. And what we need to do is we need to, in all the institutions in our society, figure out ways to get people together across the generations. Yeah. So I, I think the young and the old are different. They have different experiences and they experience the same thing at the same time in different ways. And definitely there are changes over time as technology changes our approach to hierarchies. Um, I, and you, in a very subtle way, explain some of those differences. That's not very easily tacked into. There are seven different <coughs> generations in the workforce. Uh, I think it's, it's a much more continuous uh, approach than that. There's always been intergenerational conflict. And my favorite one, and your example of being upset about being millennial, is millennial is getting quite old now. And we tend to use the word millennial for people who are young. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Well, in 100 years life, you're still very, very young. But, uh, uh, but I think you know, it's, it's, it gets in the way of actually one of the ultimate issues, which is, well, they've had a different parent, uh, upbringing, or there's new technologies. And that's really what's at stake. Yeah. And yeah. I quite like avocado as well. So it's not just millennials who can yeah. do those things. There's just a lot of diversity. So, so we should have had a Gen Z representative yes, on. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Gen Z CEO. Um, one thing I wanted, uh, it's fascinating, the, um, your perspective, Judy, is I actually wonder if there's another dynamic where uh, today with more working women, um, the number of young children that are being raised by childcare workers. And that adds another element of who's really being highly influential in a different way than in older generations. And um, at least in California, I think about 50% of childcare workers are over 50. And so how can we innovate in that space in early care and education, um, proactively bring in older adults to do work that can be difficult for young people because the salary is not high enough. Um, the hours are sometimes um, part-time, flexible. Uh, these are things that actually can be benefits for older workers uh, who are looking for more flexibility. But then we have to look at certification training. Uh, how would we actually help older generations who maybe grew up with a different mentality around either childcare or youth development, child development, and, um, and, and get them prepared to do that kind of work, so. Um, I'm going to apologize to this gentleman here. We, we are out of time, oh. but... Oh. Oh. Harry, is it okay if I have him ask a question? <laughs> don't want to put that on you, never mind. Uh, why don't, maybe you can ask the question after the panel. I do apologize because they have someone coming in after us. But question was, which one's Andre Wrong panel. Wrong <laughs> <laughs> <Long, long> session. <laughs> My gosh, that would be a surprise. Uh, thank you very much for everybody up here. I think the conversation was wonderful. Thank you.